Good afternoon uh, or good evening to some. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today to the webinar, A Hot Market for Renewable Cooling, uh, which is part of the This is Cool webinar series hosted together with the uh, Cool Coalition, UN Environment, IRENA, and Sustainable Energy for All. Um, I, my name is Lily Riahi, and I will be uh, chairing um, part of the event today and welcoming you to the session. So, um, cooling is not uh, only about comfort, but it is key for our health and our livelihoods. From ensuring that we can deliver uh, vaccines viably to all corners of the market, all corners of the world, to helping the farmer get his crops to market without spoiling, to ensuring that the most vulnerable are safe from extreme heat, and our workforces remain productive. We are, we need to increase access to cooling, but we have uh, an irony at play. The more that we cool, uh, the more we are heating the planet. And that is because currently cooling consumes about 10% of our um, power, it's 10% of power consumption. And most of that is met by fossil fuels. So um, that's why it's contributing to about 7% of greenhouse gas emissions today. Over the next few decades, we are going to see this uh, grow to um, about this equivalent of, it's going to triple to the equivalent of what India and China consume today in their electricity capacity, in electricity consumption. So if you think about that magnitude of electricity um, requirement for the cooling sector, you can see why uh, not tackling the cooling challenge will completely derail our efforts to achieve the energy transition, to achieve the Paris Agreement, and to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals. So we simply cannot we cannot achieve these objectives without making a transition to climate friendly, efficient, and renewable cooling. What's more is that this is not only good for the planet, but it is good also for the pocket. Many countries have the opportunity to save significant amounts of money in new uh, infrastructure for uh, power plants that would have to meet peak loads for cooling, for example. And that can be billions of dollars in avoided uh, infrastructure costs for countries. So making this transition happen is really the raison d'etre of the Cool Coalition, which I'm uh, coordinating and we are hosting this webinar today. The Cool Coalition is, is a transformative initiative of the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Summit and a joint effort of over 100 uh, partners from governments, cities, businesses, and all of the partners that are hosting this webinar today. Um, and these partners have joined forces to really support countries tackle their cooling demand in a comprehensive way. And what that means is to actually reduce demand for cooling in the first place, improve efficiency, of course, of equipment, and shift to low, uh, low um, uh, global warming potential refrigerants, but also to renewable energy. And that is why uh, we're hosting this webinar today, because the Cool Coalition actually recently launched a, a new working group on renewable uh, cooling, which is led by the International Renewable Energy Agency, by IRENA. And this uh, working group is intended to promote and mainstream the use of renewable energy in, cooling, in the cooling sector and to provide guidance to countries and stakeholders on how they can actually integrate cooling in, into, uh, sorry, integrate renewables into the cooling sector. Um, now, when we say renewable cooling, most people think about power grids and trying to green the power grid. But in fact, there's a whole wide range of renewable driven technologies that options that exist in the market today. And that depending on the climactic conditions of the country can be used in a hybrid mode. And we will hear about that today. And so um, we need these kinds of solutions because uh, th they can also, uh, coupled for example, with cold, cold energy storage can reduce um, stress from peak load on our grids. And as mentioned, also provide the climate benefits that we are looking for. So um, with that, I would like to turn over to our, uh, and our keynote today, who will um, give us an overview from um, on uh, cooling, who is from the International Solar Alliance, uh, Philip uh, Mal Malarch. Uh, over to you. You're on mute. 
Uh, Philip Mabron, you are on mute. Okay, I hope you, you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so thank you for your introduction and uh, thank you also for inviting me to, to make this introductory speech. So, first of all, let me quickly introduce ISA, the, the International Solar Alliance. You know, the first announcement uh, came in um, 2015 during COP21, where France and India jointly made the announcement. It is a treaty based on international organization headquartered in India and founded, officially founded in March 2018 which means that it's now three years old. It has 75 member countries, two dozen of which are uh, uh, still in the application process. And so far, it's not only open to the 121 country. So far, it was, uh, sorry, it, it was open to only the 121 countries located within the two tropics. But since the beginning of this year, all UN countries are welcome to join this alliance. So, hot market for renewable cooling. Yes, this is really true. And I would say for two, re two main reasons, you know, it's a hot market for renewables. Now we have to be aware that they represent two thirds of the new capacity additions in the energy sector. So considering uh, everything, coal power plants, uh, oil, uh, gas, turbine, uh, nuclear, uh, everything, wind and solar represent two thirds of the investment. And clearly, uh, hot weather is in front of us. Uh, in India, where I am located right now, we reach for the third time uh, 39 degrees in March yesterday. Uh, so far, it was happening in May and June, uh, but now it's also end of uh, April. Uh, it means it's a hot market for air conditioning, uh, with uh, also stress on water resources, uh, etc. The need to uh, to avoid food losses. Uh, so refrigeration, freezing are also solution to mitigate this effect of global warming. Uh, and I think the uh, first panel discussion will address this. And the second panel discussion will be on renewable energy technology uh, available for cooling application. And I presume it will be a lot about solar. Uh, wind is more specific to large installation and more specific to coastal areas. Uh, it's less available everywhere. Uh, solar energy offers really a large range of applications. Uh, I would say first, uh, historically with solar thermal, with absorption technologies uh, using ammonia or lithium, uh, lithium boron uh, for refrigeration and uh, air conditioning. Uh, I personally worked on such a project uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, this technology is quite reliable, uh, however, it requires a large investment and so far the market uptake has not been really bad. Uh, but solar photovoltaics, on the other hand, is clearly the newcomer uh, and really the, the game changer thanks to the price decrease. Uh, you know, in, you may not be aware that in the large power plant, the world record price is now as low as one US cent per kilowatt hour. You know, a few years ago, such a price was not expected before the year 2050. And it's already visible today. Uh, elsewhere, it's not one cent everywhere in the world. You know, elsewhere, it could be two, three, three or four cents, uh, like in Europe, especially in Northern Europe. But uh, at all scales, uh, photovoltaics is now the cheapest solution uh, to provide electricity at a price below what uh, local suppliers, uh, the utility can offer in developed countries. Uh, you have a solution for your balconies if you live in a flat or your rooftop if you live in a house. Uh, 
uh, it's also available for commercial and industrial buildings. It provides power for your self-consumption, for your car, for, uh, of course, electric vehicle, uh, for, and, and of course, for air conditioning, for space cooling. So the beauty of that space cooling application, especially, is, is clearly that the cooling needs are more or less in accordance with the irradiation profile. You know, the more you have sun, the, the hotter it is, uh, then the more cooler you, you need to be. Uh, and it, it's true that um, it, it has also to be linked with uh, energy efficiency, with, uh, with storage, thermal storage can be of interest also. Uh, in developing countries, I would say that solar energy is also available uh, everywhere. Uh, achieving universal energy access, you know, for lighting, for phone charging, for water access, and of course, again, uh, aiming at universal access for cooling. Vaccine like refrigerator are amassed during this pandemic time, and it was mentioned in the first introduction. Uh, but we now all have also examples of uh, walking cooling chambers in India, in Kenya, in Ivory Coast, in Senegal, uh, using refrigerant fluids as clean as propane, uh, therefore avoiding high greenhouse gas emission. So I will conclude that by quickly explaining the role and objective of ISA regarding all of this. You know, first, it is mainly raising awareness by showcasing examples of interest to all. Second is promoting guidelines on best practices, on uh, standards, on both technical aspects, of course, and non-technical aspects. You know, business model are very important. Regulatory framework are important. Uh, strengthening the capacity building also. And third, uh, helping in setting up good projects, you know, programs and initiatives. I will stop there and I wish you uh, a very nice, uh, very fruitful webinar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Philippe Malbranche. I think um, for reminding us that these solutions have been here for a long time and precisely uh, what is needed is to raise the awareness, as you mentioned, make sure there's good exchange of practice. And as you mentioned, of course, policy and program support the scale up. And um, we hope that this webinar and this discussion can contribute very much to um, starting the process of uh, doing uh, addressing these gaps in um, scaling up renewable energy in the cooling sector. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now uh, introduce, um, uh, ask for Clotilde, Clotilde Rossi de Chio, senior specialist from uh, the policy team of Sustainable Energy for All, to um, present her um, remarks. Clotilde, over to you. Thank you very much, Lily. Um, good afternoon. Good morning to everyone, uh, and uh, thank you very much for having me here today. So I would like to present um, this um, th this brief that will be published next year uh, next week on raising standards for um, of grid cooling appliances. Um, and um, the goal here, so we have looked at uh, different uh, cooling technologies that are uh, commonly utilized or. Um, in, in the off-grid setting, so for example, um, coupled with uh, solar home systems and um, the, how they can be supported at different levels of the multi-tier framework for measuring energy access. So here briefly, the multi-tier framework has been developed by the World Bank and is basically um, a framework that wants to help uh, identify um, with more details, um, what level of access, um, uh, in this case of electricity, um, can be um, achieved or can be utilized for different households from tier zero, which is basically no access, to tier five, which is uh, full full access to electricity. And this can be helpful uh, beyond others also for investors to identify uh, which kind of electricity access is um, uh, for a specific 
household. Um, and um, this helps determine basically which kind of service can be utilized. And there are some uh, quantitative um, parameters, which are electricity capacity and hours of electricity service received, but also some um, qualitative um, attributes that are defined uh, in this MTF, which are reliability, quality, affordability, and also leg uh, legality and uh, safety of service. So next, please. Um, and uh, so we uh, looked at the MTF, and it's important to say that the MTF uh, wants to measure is the household access to energy, so basically the supply side, but it can be also very useful when uh, we think about cooling and uh, we think at appliances and uh, basically at the demand side, so how to match which kind of uh, appliance can be utilized uh, at a specific tier. Um, based on the original MTF, so the, uh, the, the, the framework published by the World Bank, uh, they identified that fans, air coolers, the refrigerator and freezer and their conditions falls within different tiers from tier two to tier five. And, um, and, and, and based on, on um, the, the assessment, we have identified that actually fans and air coolers um, or table fans can be applied as, um, in, uh, as soon as tier one. Um, and um, for air uh, refrigerator freezers uh, can be also utilized uh, at a lower tier than uh, previously so considered, so tier three. And the same is true also for um, small and uh, more efficient air conditioners that can be utilized also um, in tier three and tier four, not only on tier five. Next. So um, we this is um, uh, an, an evaluation where we looked at uh, fans, um, refrigerator and freezers, air coolers and uh, smaller conditioners. Um, so we basically analyze uh, these technologies with a reference uh, of efficiency and in particular uh, at minimum efficiency performance standards of on-grid uh, or off-grid of technologies, on-grid technologies when available, when relevant. And um, also uh, with the uh, um, consideration of the MTF, so the multi-tier framework and the specific tier. So here is for ceiling fans. So we considered a draft EU uh, minimum efficiency performance standard, which is um, the dashed line um, as a, a comparative um, a perform a comparative standard, which is for on-grid um, ceiling fans. Uh, and um, we see that the majority of the fans considered are um, lay above the line. So are more efficient um, and uh, the dot the different colors uh, show which kind of tier each of the technology would um, be applicable for so the gray refer to tier two um, so the majority of the ceiling fans analyzed can be utilized for tier two households um, the next so Looking at pedestal fans, similar consideration. The color have navigated different tiers. So tier two is, is uh, in gray and tier three is in yellow. Um, the the um, efficiency um, reference is uh, the draft EU uh, minimum efficiency performance standards, which is uh, the lower blue line. And also in this case, the majority of the fans that have been considered and looked at um, are more efficient at um, that these standards. Next, table fan. Um, also here, here there are also two um, fans, then the one considered that can be applicable for a tier one, there are the two red dots. And again, the majority uh, of the appliances considered are tier two and uh, with a higher efficiency than and the standard for the um, standard below. So for 
this slide is refrigerators. The next one is going to be refrigerator and freezers. Here we consider the United for Efficiency Refrigerator Minimum Efficiency Performance Standards. In this case, the more efficient units are the one at the bottom of the diagram, so lower than the red line, which is the United for Efficiency Refrigerator High Efficiency Criteria. And we see here that the the, the units are across tier two and tier three. Here there are fewer so refrigerator and freezers. There are fewer units that meet the criteria, in particular the temperature which is required for a unit to be qualified as a refrigerator or freezer unit. But one that uh, lays under uh, the United Food Efficiency Combined Minimum Efficiency Performance Standard is also um, is this the most efficient unit and also belongs to tier three. Next. For air coolers, there's been more of a challenge um, identifying data that can be compared and uh, that uh, can um, also make, uh, let us make evaluation on the, the efficiency. Uh, nevertheless, um, we could identify for which applicability uh, for which tier could be um, could be matched. So there are some of them uh, could be utilized by um, tier one uh, and uh, tier two and tier three uh, households. Um, on air conditioners, we made some um, additional evaluation. So we considered also what is the maximum and uh, the minimum efficiency and capacity for each of the tier and look um, then in which ranges would um, with each unit fall depending on whether we would consider the maximum electricity that could be um, utilized in a specific tier or the minimum electricity and this again is defined by um, the MTF, the four bank MTF and we see that um, the majority of the units will be somewhere uh, uh, along uh, tier three, tier four, and tier five, uh, with the more efficient units being the one uh, on top. And we can see that smaller, uh, there seems to be a trend where that smaller units can have the highest efficiency. So I'm sorry, I have 10 minutes, so I am aware I went uh, uh, through these slides very quickly, but uh, the brief will be published next week, so I encourage you then to reach out or to read the brief for more details there. Uh, we also identified some quality criteria uh, in the same way at, in which is done by the MTF, so beyond uh, uh, the MTF compatibility and the efficiency, um, also at um, uh, quality uh, criteria that really help stakeholders differentiate uh, and help compare. And but in particular, uh, we looked at um, refrigerators, so we defined the tables as the one that can be here uh, seen for refrigerators, for air coolers, and for fans. Um, and uh, we looked then uh, at service delivery, which is um, air delivery for fans or compartment temperature and um, uh, hours uh, of uh, autonomy for refrigerators. Uh, we look at safety parameters, um, durability, environmental considerations, um, in particular at um, chemicals and the refrigerants that are utilized, and uh, how uh, what is their environmental impact. Uh, we look at consumer protection, uh, such as performance reporting, truth in advertising, uh, user manual evaluation, and um, warranty. And also we look at uh, affordability. Uh, as um, a cost per unit. And uh, these are, some of them are considered to be uh, voluntary, some are mandatory, so that these can be utilized uh, and um, applied depending on the program and, and the specific needs of the stakeholder. Next on uh, the recommendations. So we encourage and uh, we incentivize the use of the most efficient and the most efficient and best available of grid cooling appliance. Um, we um, encourage also to, to use of uh, passive solutions and if when active so that they're climate friendly um, 
and uh, with um, low um, environmental impact. We um, support information sharing for decision making uh, for uh, consumers uh, and uh, for all uh, stakeholders. Um, the design um, that the program should be designed to meet uh, the needs of vulnerable population, so both from uh, from all perspectives. But considering, for instance, uh, the uh, last mile delivery for remote solution for remote areas and um, uh, also um, payment uh, conditions such as uh, PayGo uh, that might make um, products more um, affordable or uh, and adopt and implement standards, support testing infrastructure to enable accurate measurement and uh, comparison, as well as include measurement and evaluation in the program design. And um, we also suggest to look um, uh, more deeply uh, and uh, to look at uh, off-grid cooling appliances and how this uh, consumption that are given um, by the cooling appliance can be um, evaluated within the MTF, also considering uh, the utilization of our other appliance too. Um, the next, I uh, wanted to would like to mention too that um, um, that we will be publishing as part of um, uh, this is cool um, campaign and uh, together with the cool coalition chilling prospects um, that will be published um, in 5th of May, uh, where we track sustainable cooling for all. So if you don't have any guide, just uh, reach out and. Um, the next, my last slide uh, on the This is Cool uh, campaign, uh, also to look at this is cool.sc4.org. And um, this is um, again happy to be to be part of, of this campaign and this workshop. Thank you. And um, so, more information on the brief and then specific on the evaluation and uh, how this has been done will be. Um, will be published uh, next week and will be uh, available online. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Clotilde. Um, clearly, thanks to the analysis of Sustainable Energy for All in this upcoming brief, we will hopefully be able to get to a, a closer understanding of what we need to do to ensure that uh, off-grid um, appliances in the market are the most um, efficient and climate friendly as possible. Uh, in order to really be able to unlock the opportunity of um, access to cooling uh, and ensure we reach as many people as possible. So thank you for that important uh, presentation. Um, now we will move into um, the panel discussion, which will be focused on um, growing uh, cooling needs. And we will be looking at uh, different perspectives from um, various countries in the uh, Asia uh, region. So uh, with us today, we have, um, and I will also speak in the order that I will call the countries, we have um, Ms. Cook, who's the National Ozone Officer from the uh, Department of Climate Change and Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Vietnam. We have uh, Girja Shankar from Energy Efficiency Service Limited in India. And we have Vatanak Cheng, who's the Deputy Director of the National Committee for Subnational democratic development in uh, Cambodia. So, um, panelists will have uh, three minutes to respond to the questions. Uh, and I will start with you, uh, Cook, if I may. So, um, as with many other countries, of course, cooling has been identified as a um, key sector to achieving the country's climate goals. Uh, in fact, uh, Vietnam is a, is a leader in having incorporated cooling in the uh, enhanced uh, nationally determined contributions. And you've actually also developed a national cooling action plan. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what sectors or areas are the ones in which you see the most uh, demand or the higher cooling requirements in, in Vietnam? Thank you, Lily. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm very glad to be here today and joining the, the online session. So, uh, 
we got to the questions that has been raised. Cooling demand is actually growing rapidly in, in, in our country. I have to say that uh, in, in, may, in very fast growth in many areas, the populations grow, the uh, living standards are increasing uh, rapid urbanizations also causing uh, a lot of demand for cooling in the country. So I may say that the residential and the commercial uh, air conditioning in the country are major, major sectors with very high cooling demand uh, requirement in the country. Uh, let's the market for residential and commercial AC in the country has increased from 15 to 30 percent in few years before the COVID-19 situations. Well, it, it gets a lot decreased in the in the last uh, two years. Uh, and and um, the AC um, uh, accounts for a promo a promise approximately 40 to 60 percent of the total energy consumption in buildings and co uh, construction site. And um, refrigerations and air conditioning uh, in residential appliance accounts for two to three percent of the um, electricity consumption per year. So the figures has shown that um, a majority of electricity is used uh, for uh, in in cooling uh, areas, and if it is left unmanaged. Um, then there will be a lot of impact um, and contribute greatly to the global warming. Um, also, uh, impact on the on the energy um, security of the country. So, for for that, the role of efficient and sustainable cooling has been um, highly aware by our, by our our government, and for that, we have included the um, actions on on cooling in our. NDC, which is updated just recently. Um, and beyond that, we are trying to uh, to uh, investigate some opportunities to work down in um, the provincial level. For example, the uh, we try to um, to um, establish the two pilot cities in collaboration with UNEP and GGI. We're working on a project uh, with the aim to uh, help the province develop their urban cooling action plan. Uh, and for that, we will expect to um, uh, help the provinces to um, mobilize resources and also to ensure that the application, uh, replication of the work uh, to be expanded. Um, in central level, we, we, we uh, expect that there will be a a cooling fund to be established um, under the existing environmental protection fund so that we can um, uh, increase the support for implementation of cooling uh, effort in the country. So, um, so, so in ad addition to that, um, uh, I think in November, we has become a member to the Cool Coalition also, and this would help us to expand our knowledge and help us to get opportunity opportunities to uh, share uh, experience and learn from other countries and 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 also possibility to uh, to to uh, to see efficient and climate friendly cooling across the sectors and that is very very crucial and, and important thank you lily Thank you, Cook. Um, really interesting. So obviously rapid urbanization is the main driver, um, as you mentioned, and residential and commercial demand for AC. I'd be interested to know, you said it's increased from 15 to 30% in the last years, which is quite significant. Um, and um, I'd be interested, you said maybe it's decreased in the time of COVID, but uh, I wonder if uh, residential may have even increased while commercial might have decreased. Um, that would be interesting to know. But um, with the urbanization being um, the main driver and having developed, being developing these urban cooling action plans, what role do you think renewable energy technologies can have in, in meeting uh, the cooling demand in these urban areas? Are there specific technologies that are going to be prioritized or um, to meet this commercial and residential demand? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the... Uh... The, the urban communities is of uh, high risk as well. In some areas, they are 
uh, having a lot of um, uh, severe risks with the extreme heat. And mm -hmm. and for that reason, we um, we have got uh, some of the potential cooling technology to be used. For example, the cooling part um, as the as the uh, efficient um, energy uh, saving uh, capacity. And then also there are some other integrated technology that uh, at the same time include energy efficiency solutions with inverter technology and, and the uh, centralized control system for monitoring purpose. So those are made on the flat platform of the central chiller system. Um, uh, well, from, uh, from my point of view, view i think the for residential ac the in inverter technology with the use of uh, uh, environmental friendly like the uh, r32 still seems to be the choice of the most manufacturer for the time being um well yeah for renewable energy i think we still in like policies to promote the use of of uh, renewable and off-grid technologies I, I don't know in the in the time to come probably it will uh, if if the t uh, understanding is uh, a bit more enhanced then probably we can incorporate it by um, uh, putting it in the legal framework or the uh, promotion of uh, standards. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the chance to do it now as the um, environmental law uh, uh, has been revised and it provides us the opportunity to develop a um, uh, under law. A decree and that we are working on it, but I'm um, I'm not so certain whether we can we can put in all the elements for this for the time being. Um, as also mentioned earlier, that we're working on uh, a project called sustainable urban cooling that I mentioned just now uh, with uh, Cool Coalition and uh, with um, uh, support of UNEP and GGI, we try to promote the implementation of Kigali, the KSAT program and the K Kigali amendment in Vietnam. So the aim of the project is, is to increase actions at the uh, provincial level. Uh, the people that are being uh, affected by urbanization and, and also with some support from the um, central uh, government in terms of policy support, capacity building, um and and we engage with the private sectors so um so i think for uh, the technology there's still not the optimal uh technology to be used but uh um we have the chance now to uh, practice and to find out the best practices and also to learn from other other countries that is uh, far uh, advanced and and also uh, is the possibility to share experience across the country. So I think it is really the benefit that people can bring in from this platform like this. And thank you for the chance. Thank you very thank you. much. Um, thank you so much. So I think if we can take from that that, um, and I think I mentioned this in the, in the beginning, it's sort of the belief that although it's been something uh, renewable technologies exist and uh, different applications for renewable energy um, driven cooling, um, the awareness um, is, is is lacking and what is really needed, as you mentioned, is some um, exchange and knowledge and also policy uh, support. And I think what you mentioned in terms of the legal framework and potentially incorporating renewable energy into the into that framework, um, the environmental decree, I think it is that you've mentioned uh, where you'll be tackling cooling is um, quite promising, as well as looking at um, the uh, state level and urban level actions and where renewable energy can be incorporated. Hopefully, um, this a new working group um, that will be led with uh, IRENA uh, under the Cool Coalition can um, provide some support and input or guidance on um, these best practices that you have, um, um, you know, would like to uh, learn more about. Um, especially since Vietnam, of course, has so much um, solar. I think we saw a huge surge of that with the with the recent uh, with the feed-in tariff you had in place uh, previously. So, um, thank you so much, Cook. I think it was very interesting um, to hear from you. And uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to turn to uh, Batanak. And, and um, actually, uh, you also are developing, um, you know, it's first your first national cooling action plan and. Um, can you hear me? Sorry, I hear a bit of echo. 
Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. I can okay, hear great. you uh, quite fine. Yes, thank you, Lily. Great. I understand your video is, is not going to be working, but um, we'll still hear you very clearly, so that's good. Um, so as I was saying, I know that you're also meeting on, on tackling the polling challenge, having developed the first uh, comprehensive national polling action plan. Um, can you also tell us a little bit about the sectors uh, that have been identified in, in your country having uh, significant uh, polling uh, demand and need? Thank, thank you, Lily, for proposing this question. Um, now, uh, before I respond to this question, I would like to give some context as to what the energy sector is like in Cambodia. Um, we noticed that Cambodia enjoyed a fast economic growth since 2000, and, and largely due to a number of sectors. So we have government, textile, tourism, and agriculture. With these rapid growth, um, we can see that the energy consumption has been um, uh, also increased at the same time. Um, uh, it, if the, according to a recent study, the demand has increased threefold from the year 2000 to the year 2020. And according to the Economic Research Institute uh, for ASEAN and East Asia, um, they also have forecasted that the double of energy demand will increase uh, by double uh, from 2020 to 2040. Now, when we when we look at uh, the demand has increased um, uh, in terms of supply size, um, the government foresee this as a near and long term challenges. So we need to look at various energy sectors, um, electricity, fossil fuel, renewable energy, and how do we prioritize them? So renewable energy um, is 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 one of the um, uh, commitment that Cambodia is is setting himself at. Uh, having a target of 25% of rene renewable energy in our energy mix by 2030, which is a little bit shy of the ASEAN uh, en renewable energy target by 23% by 2030. Now, um, uh, with with the with the understanding of of the energy demand uh, demand and supply size, um, Cambodia at a national level, um, with with a consortium of um, national actors, uh, we now have understand that um, uh, uh, cooling uh, requirements and also demand is also increasing. Efficiencies and um, and, and 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 conservations of energy play a big role in this. So um, uh, hence the development of the uh, national coalition actions. Um, plan is being developed currently. So the sector that I, I raised earlier, um, mainly the, the agriculture sectors, and then of course, uh, garment, uh, you're looking at a building that are fitted for our manufacturings. And of course, uh, hospitality, uh, there's a boom in um, um, uh, hoteliers and um, uh, a number of other infrastructure as well. So these are gonna be the sector that the, the National Cooling uh, Action Plan will be focusing on. And then this will respond to, of course, to the um, National Determined uh, contribution update recently, uh, we have prioritized the renewable energy as a mitigation actions that will be us on orders to fulfill that. So um, when we speak about uh, efficiencies, uh, uh, cool, uh, uh, cooling um, um, uh, food security is, is also quite vital. And then um, this will also contribute to um, the action plan that we have in terms of reducing the uh, GHG emission reduction by 20, uh, 2030. Um, thank you so much for the question, Lily. I mean, it really shows that in different countries, you really have different priority sectors. So I think that's uh, really uh, interesting to see the contrast, for example, uh, between uh, the response from Cook and, and your response. I think that's, um, and then the second thing is, of course, um, really exciting to hear that you've also included uh, cooling and renewable energy uh, in your uh, enhanced NDC. So uh, congratulations for that. Um, with regards to, I mean, you are uh, working in the subnational level, and you're you're describing the national policy framework. Um, I'm wondering what you foresee as you know the different policies and actions, perhaps at different levels uh, of government to actually enable the achievement of um, uh, tackling you know the agricultural sector. Uh, and the cooling demand that comes with that. Um, to, to sorry, if, I'm sorry if anybody does has background uh, has these speakers on. If my speaker um, panelists, please on you. There's just some background noise. Um, sorry, I don't know if you could hear me about tonight. But what my question was is, 
you know, uh, what are the policies and actions that you're undertaking um, to basically meet the cooling requirements of um, the agricultural sector and hospitality sector that you've mentioned? Um, and what role do you see specifically for renewables and perhaps off-grid uh, renewable energy solutions as well in, in your strategy? So when we look at actions um, and uh, action plan uh, to undertake this um, uh, cooling requirement, we need to consider um, uh, stakeholders and how they play a role in achieving these objectives. So we can identify two tiers. So at the national level um, and also at the local government level. So when we um, uh, discuss with the national level, um, uh, their response is to engage um, uh, 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 stakeholders, specifically development partner and then um, global climate funds to access finance and then to create a development program and project for implementations. Now, um, we, we understand that um, at the national level, we have done a number of country programming and entity work program that uh, through these programs that will ensure uh, certain components of uh, uh, sustainable financing to use uh, renewable energies. And then that um, will, will integrate into um, a number of other um, renewable energy off-grid energy solution as well. And then um, uh, the idea behind uh, developing program and project for implementation is to ensure that our local government, uh, which is the project implementer, are able to build their capacity so that um, awareness and understanding about uh, uh, cooling is being raised, and then there are certain solutions are being adopted through the implementation. And one way of one way to ensure the sustainability of development is to integrate them into our local government investment planning, where they use their um, development uh, budget um, uh, to prioritize the need of the people, um, and there. There we we need to um, uh, review uh, the the performance evaluation through project development, and then also um, uh, from there we can uh, rethink how we want to approach uh, this program development. So uh, a num a number of technology that that we we have um, um, uh, worked with uh, uh, through the Empower project with the UNEP is to look at the urban cooling uh, that is being um, uh, feasible at the uh, local level. Uh, we selected certain um, uh, target provinces that are vulnerable to um, to climate change, specifically those who don't have access to grid. Uh, so we're looking at off-grid technologies, and then we need to match up with um, private sector who, who provide that services, and then want to make sure that they, they economic is there uh, so that the investment uh, is makes sense. As you know, um, renewable te technology is still quite um, costly for Cambodia. Um, so we need to uh, make better uh, uh, utilize the different modality in terms of financing to ensure that uh, the investment does make sense and also is, is equitable to, uh, to the beneficiary. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, um, Vatanak. Uh, I think that um, uh, what's interesting is to hear that um, you're taking this multi-level governance approach to actually uh, tackle the, the cooling challenge uh, and to uh, ensure that you're also incorporating renewables. That again, it's looking at the local level. Um, so funny that although Vietnam's challenge was more on um, residential and commercial buildings and yours is more looking at uh, the agricultural sector and, and off grid from, from what you've said. So very different um, in both countries. You have the, the multi level governance approach uh, leading to success as well as um, strong um, financing uh, mechanisms to support uh, tackling the sector and scaling up uh, renewable and efficient solutions. Um, that's the other point that I heard from both of you is that efficiency is there as well as renewables, which is really the comprehensive approach the Cool Coalition is looking to, to promote. You have to, you know, reduce the demand in order to then be able to tackle the rest with renewables. So really interesting. Uh, thank you for your interventions and hopefully the SE for All um, off-grid uh, uh, report. I don't have the name in front of me, but um, the uh, new report on, on raising standards for off-grid appliances can also support some of the work you're doing, um, looking at off-grid uh, solutions with Empower project. Uh, so, um, in addition to the working group led by Irina, now I will move forward to um, our final panelist, which is um, Girja Shankar uh, from Energy Efficiency Services Limited um, in India. 
So, of course, India is a uh, global leader in renewable energy technologies, as, as everyone knows. And at the same time, you've also been um, called a, a leader even by the UN Secretary General on the example of your National Cooling Action Plan. So, um, it'd be I'd be keen to hear from you how you see these two lines of work coming together. Um, you know, the the leadership on cooling on one side and your leadership on renewable energy on the other side. Um, and and specifically, what role do you see uh, ESL playing in in bringing these two areas together? Over to you, Girja. Is Girja there? Hello. Hello. I'm oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I can I can see you, but I see you're here. But, oh, there we go. Great. Thank okay. you. Did you Thank hear you. my question, or do you need me to repeat? Yeah, I, I hear, heard your question. So, Great. thanks a lot. Thank you. Provide me an opportunity to just discuss on the Indian perspective on the Indian, this uh, the subject. So you are aware that the India, there are the two three uh, I think national documents which guides the policies and the markets on renewable as well as the cooling. So you may be aware that India is uh, the among the first country who has declared this INDC, uh, ICAP, Indian Cooling Action Plan, and the major thrust under the Indian Cooling Action Plan is to provide the medium term, long term, the strategies for reducing the cooling demand, reducing the cooling energy requirement, also reducing the refrigerant demand from the uh, cooling sector. So these are the three, four, I think the targets has been decided under the Indian Cooling Action Plan. And they have provided the uh, short term, medium term, and long term targets for the different stakeholders. You are also aware that the mostly uh, the Indian perspective for the coolings uh, we can say in the three or four uh, terms. One as a thermal comfort, so we can see at the commercial buildings or the residential building where the thermal comfort will be the major thrust. The second may be the sustainable cooling. So India is promoting the low GHG emission based related cooling. And it uh, comprises not only the uh, air conditioner, but also the energy efficient uh, uh, ventilation and the uh, cooling related solutions. The third one is the India uh, government of India's priority is doubling the farmers income. So through better cold chain infrastructure, better value produced to the farmers and the less wastage of the produce. So from the cold chain, uh, uh, India government is targeting that farmers can be benefited and their income can be doubled. The uh, last one you can say the government of India is highly focused nowadays on the make in India. So domestic manufacturing of the air conditioner related cooling equipment is also one of the thrust area. Now, government recently had announced and bring this uh, air conditioning manufacturing units for under the PLI, the um, uh, production link incentive. So it is a very big thrust given for the Make in India program where the uh, uh, different type of the technologies can be manufactured within India and they can provide the solution. Also, the cooling is linked with the human health and the productivity. So uh, the, it has the direct and indirect linkage with the sustainable development goals. The second uh, document we can say that uh, one is the INDC, where the government of India is committed that 33 to 35% reduction in, uh, in uh, energy efficiency related economy. And uh, there are also targeted that 40% of installed capacity of the, uh, it should be from the renewables. So government of India has already announced that the 450 gigawatt we have to uh, develop by the 2030. And it is a very big thrust by uh, deciding this target. Already India is uh, uh, having the renewable contribution around 24 to 26%. And once we be achieve, able to achieve this 450 gigawatt, 
that certainly it will give the very major thrust and we will nearly reaching out to uh, around more than 35 percent uh, contribution through the renewables so you are right that the india's uh, priority that we are already i think leading this isa the international solar alliance and government of india and the different ministries ministry of new and renewable ministry of uh, environment forest and climate change and ministry of power all three are targeting that uh, this cooling demand or the energy related to cooling uh, demand can be added with the different type of integration so the government of india the uh, the strategy is that first to reduce down the demand second integrate the energy efficiency and also integrate the renewable so in overall in long term perspective we can say it is a consolidated or comprehensive approach uh, are targeting and esl also see uh, providing the different solutions uh, and in integrating our programs to achieve these targets. So uh, you are aware that with the support of the UNEP and ADB, ESL has launched out this super efficient air conditioning program. And if we see the total market share of the uh, room air conditioner, so there are around six to, it is around seven to eight million uh, air conditioners are sold every year in the market. And uh, out of these uh, sold air conditioner, around there, uh, 80% are the splits. And if we want to see that the uh, super efficient air conditioner, so these are not so much. Mostly the most sold ACs are the three star rated AC. So with the support of the, you know, PSL has uh, designed the program and we are promoting the super efficient air conditioner with low GWP global warming potential zero ODS potential and also very efficient. I think the ICR 5.4 ESL has launched this program in uh, 2000, two years back. And now uh, at that time, there is no uh, air conditioner uh, available with this uh, type of efficiency. Now few companies have brought down and we are targeting that we are going to the third phase. So and in the third phase, we are targeting not only the split air conditioner, there is also a good demand of the window air conditioner. So we are uh, integrating window as well as the split air conditioner. So these are, uh, this is the, for the air conditioner. Second, uh, ESL is also uh, targeting to develop and designing a program for the chiller replacement program. So we, we are already with the support of the uh, USAID program. We are working on that and probably by, by in the uh, one or two months, we will uh, launch this program. And we target that the uh, chillers, which, uh, which are more than 10 years old, should be replaced with the, under this program. And uh, uh, every consumers will be uh, got benefited with the efficient chillers and we will also blend in the other in, uh, innovative technologies it, whether it may be the in, uh, automation the bms or the ems system or the other uh, innovative technology it may be the data analytics or the some there are some uh, thermal fluids related projects or technology are, are nowadays are coming. So we are integrating all these solutions in this national chiller replacement program and we will uh, launch soon. We are also with, uh, working on the this district cooling system where the multiple source of the uh, air conditioning technologies can be blended and a, in a comprehensive way we can able to provide the low uh, uh, this uh, non refrigerant technology and also the integration of the renewable can be integrated to get the optimized value for the air conditioning uh, through the DCS or the district cooling system. So these are the, uh, the priorities of the ESL and we are working uh, on uh, these areas. And we see that we are able to create the good energy efficient uh, technologies blended under the, our program. Recently, we have uh, conducted one study on the cold chain. 
So you may be aware there is a uh, uh, one of the outcome of that study is that there are around 25% loss across from the produce to the retail ma market. And if we uh, quantify the 5% is loss at the farmer level, 9 to 10% around the storage level, and 4 to 5% at wholesale market, and 8 to 10% around the retail level. And so this study is targeted with the West Bengal, and the outcome of this study is that if we are able to reduce down this 25%, this uh, uh, the total uh, the loss of 25 percent we are able to minimize around the 10 percent uh, if we are able to create or provide the good solution for the uh, cold chain infrastructure or cold storage for the uh, particularly in the West Bengal the potato is the main uh, farmers uh, produce which are taking care through the cold storage so we are working on that and uh, 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 as per the outcome of this study, that there is a very huge potential. It is around that the 3.6 million tons of potatoes loss can be minimized, and this will result in around 656 crore per annum. So it is a very huge market at this. So not only this, uh, the one state, there are uh, other states and other uh, the cold chain. I think the re uh, requirements may exist. And we are working uh, on developing the different type of the business model and aggregation of the demand, which is, uh, I think, one of the uniqueness of our program. So once we able to aggregate the demand, provide uh, the aggregation of the services, and then go for the bulk procurement, then certainly we able to create the good business model where the cold storage owner can be benefited and we are uh, we are able to reduce down this the loss which which are going to occur because of the poor infrastructure or poor handling from produce to the retail market hello oh thank you yeah. so much sorry i guess they they muted me um thank you so much for your presentation um i think it's um uh, always uh, very inspiring to hear about the, as mentioned by you, the very comprehensive approach that India is taking to tackle the cooling challenge um, and the, the role of ESL in particular. Um, also, I think what I hear from your presentation and the panel was the diverse um, needs. So the fact that you uh, are also looking at, uh, for example, doubling farmers' incomes um, and looking at really scaling up the cold chain as uh, cold storage, I suppose, to support that or integrated cold chain, I think is um, is very interesting uh, and shows that, you know, as I said in the beginning, that cooling is really not only about thermal comfort. And while this is going to be continuing to be the large market segment, um, in the coming, uh, in the next coming, you know, decade, I think the, there's going to be significant growth in the um, cold, need for cold storage, and we're hearing that also coming out in these panels. Um, and uh, and then, of course, I think you're, the integrated approach that you're taking with looking at uh, reducing demand, improving efficiency, and um, then looking also at how to integrate renewables uh, is, is um, very uh, something that we can uh, learn from uh, also. Um, I think we're just a bit late on time. So I ha we had intended to have questions but and answers with the audience, but unfortunately, um, because the presentations have been uh, so interesting, we've not had a chance, we're a bit over time now um, for the Q&A. But if you send your questions in chat, um, we will be sure to um, get them to the presenters and answer them for you um, after this session. So please don't hesitate to still send your questions and I do see some questions already in the chat. Um, but due to time, I would like to move on now to the next session. Um, but I would like to thank our panelists uh, for presenting um, these very interesting uh, perspectives on uh, how cooling is 
growing in their countries and the various uh, needs and demands, and also how cooling is being tackled at different levels and where renewable energy is being featured. I think um, the next uh, panel, um, which will be on the next section, which is on renewable energy technologies, um, cooling applications, what are the, what's the scope and opportunities, uh, which will be led by um, Yang Chen, a program officer and lead for the uh, sustainable urban energy at IRENA, is actually a perfect segue uh, to uh, respond to some of the requests for um, knowledge and best practice and support in integrating uh, renewable energy in the cooling sector. So over to you, Yang, and apologies for the delay. Okay, no problem. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lily, for the kind introduction. Also, uh, thanks to the pa previous panels, at uh, least, and for uh, giving us the overview of what happening in our country in terms of uh, cooling demand and also the challenge you are facing. And hopefully this session and uh, the uh, second part of this session will give you um, and uh, uh, some solutions and uh, to address those challenges. And uh, uh, technology-wise, uh, let me just uh, give a quick, very quick and um, uh, context in terms of uh, scoping, you know, of, of a cooling, renewable uh, cooling technologies. Basically, we're talking about cooling, and it's uh, uh, three, in, in, by scales, we can have three levels, an individual and household level, or residential or buildings, and or centralized and uh, cooling uh, system. That's, you can have a building or building, several buildings, the building blocks. And, uh, and also, that's we have a district and uh, cooling uh, systems. So this is uh, for large scale and cooling uh, solutions. And uh, so this is by scale. So you have the three type of uh, cooling uh, solutions. And also by source, you can right now, this is have uh, electricity driven cooling and systems and currently is dominant. And uh, another one is uh, thermal uh, driven and uh, technologies, which you know uh, it's going to be part of our uh, discussion today. And uh, the last one is the free cooling to cause, you know, ambience, the, the thermal sink. And usually and um, coupled with uh, uh, heat pumps and together using you know, the ambience air, water uh, sources or ground source, like ground source thermal uh, energy to uh, to use uh, to to provide cooling and uh, demand. So those are the sort of a, uh, categorization of cooling uh, options. And uh, today we have very polite actually three at this panelists and uh, to give us a talk and about you know their solutions and uh, and first let me introduce let me invite introduce and also invite and uh, Mr. Lars uh, Munker and uh, Munker is the co-founder and uh, also uh, director of uh, uh, Purex it's an uh, energy uh, cooling and uh, solution or with uh, solar uh, thermal energy. And uh, he, he before he started his uh, own business, he's uh, working uh, for a, big, a large uh, industry company called uh, uh, Danesco. And so he gained a lot of experience and also to have a passion on the um, uh, sustainabilities. And they put actually his ambition and into uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, journey. So that's leading us to today, and uh, we would like I would like to invite uh, uh, Lars. You are you there? Right. Okay. Yeah. Give us yes, yeah. Of, yeah, about the renewable. Good morning. Good coding. afternoon to everyone, and thank you, Yong Chen, for the introduction. I'll just give you a short introduction to our considerations um, when our company Purix decided to. Uh, may, maybe Lars, just before, sorry to yes. interrupt you, just before you start, uh, uh, because since we have a little bit of running out of time for the for the sake of, of time, and uh, uh, I would like to put a question if uh, ahead actually of our discussion, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. because you know from the last uh, session, previous session and discussion, we heard a lot of uh, uh, challenge in you know Cambodia and uh, Vietnam and the India. And the biggest problem is that is, uh, the cooling demand, if you use electricity to address that, is a big headache for them. Because this is adding more and more electricity that they, they, they don't have right now. They should add actually, especially the peak, it's gonna be very expensive for those countries, the power system. I agree. It sounds to me, that is your system and uh, you know not using electricity. So it's like a pink killer. 
so provide them, you know, a solution. So I would like to see how maybe I'm going to talk, how actually you address your product into that market. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you could say that in short, um, our systems detach from the power grid in the sense that uh, we bring the energy supply and um, differently from um, from using electricity. In some countries, electricity for cooling um, accounts for more than 60 or even 70 percent of the power peak on a national scale. So our product and our technology upon when we sat down and uh, had an ambition to enter in sustainable cooling um, market, uh, we simply decided on a technology which um, took out uh, electricity as the main energy input for cooling out of the power equation for a household, but also at a national level. And uh, I'll just give you an in short introduction to to the considerations for our uh, circular design concept for our systems and the products uh, and then finally just give you a short introduction to what's the outcome and also some of the the key figures please so please uh, if you could help me shift this uh, slide so basically as we discussed also in the previous panel the issue here is that the cooling demand in general is on the rise uh, globally uh, both because of uh, wealth, but also the way we construct our homes and also because of comfort level health issues or health aspects. And, uh, and that's basically, uh, that's a, one of the key challenges. And another of these key challenges is when thinking of addressing cooling demand in the future, is that the majority of the growth of cooling is um, is in the low capacity segment, um, small multi split or mono split systems with very low capacity for residential, commercial, retail, makes up about eighty percent of all the cooling demand. So, when addressing sustainable cooling, it's very essential that uh, the technology and the solutions presented they are affordable and attractive for the low capacity market. So please um, continue to the next slide. So what we did here is that we decided to opt for providing a solution to the mass market, the low capacity market below 10, 15 kilowatts. And um, the, the, market, uh, the, pro the market projections by the International Energy Agency and others is, is massive. I mean, we currently have about 2 billion air conditioners installed globally. And that number apparently is going to rise to about 5.6 billion in a few decades. So it's, it's a huge challenge on top of this. So from an energy perspective, from a, a, another challenge is, of course, the use of the refrigerants that globally society has decided to phase down the use of F gases. So a sustainable system needs to have a natural refrigerant integrated that is not flammable. So natural and not flammable, that's essential. And of course, then uh, driving down the greenhouse gas emissions, so then we decided to detach from the use of power and just use uh, solar radiation as an energy supply. Then people can back up for operation at night with a storage or um, a boiler, whatever would be in place. So, but the real challenge here is that sustainable technology is usually more expensive to procure than an ordinary split air conditioner that you could just plug into the power grid because the, um, the power production uh, investment is held by the power company and society. But in this case, it's actually the end user that is going to pay for the energy supply. So the decision to buy, we need to work with uh, stakeholders and policymakers to drive the, the focus from buying the lowest equipment with the shortest lifetime to a system that has the lowest annual cost of operation. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's quite a task, I'll tell you. And secondly, also the access to finance, because once people, they look at that they can actually save money on the operation, on the maintenance and the lifespan of equipment, um, because cheap air conditioners usually don't last long. Um, 
but then people need to buy a new one. So how can we stimulate, like it has been for 10 years, even more um, the case for leasing, rental, or access to financing, integrate that as a common solution when people, they think of cooling. So that's basically our design uh, task that we put ourselves up front. Please uh, continue to the next slide. So what we decided here was to um, make use of two conventional technologies. Solar thermal has been on the market for decades, well-proven, reliable. Absorption chillers, which is a technology invented in the 1850s that can produce cold or cooling from a heat source instead of electricity. No moving parts, no compressor, very simple, long technical lifetime. So, the, but unfortunately they are not available as a as a complete cooling system. So you can easily just buy a absorption chiller from 100 kilowatt, one megawatt, 200 megawatt, but that doesn't give you a cooling system. Uh, you need distribution, you need the heat source, you need the automation to make it speak together, whatever. So that's going to be quite complicated, but certainly most important, costly. So what we did, we, we um, cherry picked the solar thermal um, energy supply, and then we redesigned absorption chiller uh, using water and lithium bromide and put that together in a package similar to a split, a multi-split uh, air conditioning system. So that we had the um, advantages of a flexible and modular design that end users are familiar with the split, uh, plug and play addressing the low capacity market, which is essential for addressing the challenges of the rising cooling demand and using water with a global warming potential of zero and uh, using low temperature heating instead of electricity. So the outcome is, uh, please change the side, slide to the next, is basically this simple design where indoor end users have one, two, three, four cooling devices, similar to the one they are used to from split air conditioners. And outside they have a, um, two, a set of two solar collectors producing heating and connected to, to a small air-cooled co uh, absorption chiller that produces cold water. And um, we invented this um, over the course of since the company was founded in 2012. And uh, since then, we have been maturing, developing. And on the next slide, you can see that we now have uh, two different types of products because one is the type of where we ship and pre-pack uh, plug and play systems. Um, but in order to also accommodate um, competitiveness and use of locally available technology and products, uh, we are increasingly focusing on shipping just the chillers and um, letting people source fan coils or solar collectors in the local market where there is a good network of uh, distributors, installers and um, service providers for the maintenance. So in order to um, accommodate use of locally available workforce and components, that's probably what we see is on the rise. Please change to the next uh, page. Sorry, this uh, Lars, could you please uh, you know, a little bit speed up? The yes, I think this is the final. Thank you. I think so, yes. So just to give you an example here uh, for Abila in, in Italy, with a multi-split system of 2.5 kilowatt, with fan coils using water, which is called R718 um, as refrigerant. And the outcome is that we can basically cut 80% of the power demand for air conditioning, 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and 55% of the annual cost of ownership. And the additional cost in buying solar cooling versus a uh, conventional air conditioner is a payback of just three years. So that was one example and also the introduction to uh, our drivers for designing and now manufacturing this. Please, um, I think that's all that I had decided to share with you today. And you are, of course, 
always welcome to drop us an email or call us at any time if you are interested in exploring more about um, cooling powered by thermal energy, solar thermal and water's refrigerant. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lars, for a very interesting end of presentation. I'm sorry to rush you up a little, a little bit. No worries. Okay. Oh, what well, well, interesting thing you you touched upon that you said uh, you know if you buy the electricity driven split you know this unit and uh, basically it's uh, the energy from your utilities and the, from your side you detach and so that's a little more expensive but the, the consumers are a little bit confused. I just wonder if this is something the consumer because their awareness. Or because actually, because it sounds to me, it's a utility will come to you. It says that, you know, large, here's the X, one, Z amount of money. Mm. <laughs> you help us because we mm. don't want to put, you know, a natural gas picker out there. Mm -hmm. It's so expensive every year. I use only one to 3% of ours. Mm. So it's, it sounds to me, this is a question and that you can keep the hold to think about it, Then we can probably discuss when we, after we uh, presentation to others to speak. Yes. Thank Certainly. You. Yeah. And uh, now I would like to invite the uh, next speaker, um, Mon uh, Sab Salib. And he's from uh, Envy and uh, he's the senior director of uh, smart operation and uh, optimization of the company and uh, dealing with uh, uh, district energy and uh, solutions, especially for the uh, uh, water source and uh, cooling uh, system. So this is a, a, it's a large system. It's a, a, a district uh, cooling system. It's to provide actually the, uh, it's increasingly becoming popular, I will say globally, because when we see the uh, demand increase, this is not only increase overall efficiency, but also actually cut uh, and uh, the use of, of freons or, you know, uh, uh, and traditional and uh, reprocessing. So this is, uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Salip, and I think you are, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Young. Um, uh, glad to be here with all of you and an interesting conversation with the beautiful minded people. Uh, it is uh, uh, this, this, I think this webinar should last for at least four hours to cover everybody's. It is interesting how uh, around the globe, everybody is talking about renewable cooling and, and the influence um, uh, we have uh, when it comes to uh, district energy and renewable cooling. Uh, I would, uh, in, in the sake of time, I'll just skip to the third slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm from N-Wave Energy Corporation, and N-Wave is the largest district uh, energy heating, cooling, uh, and power in North America. Uh, we manage assets all across North America, and, 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 and we focus on not traditional, it is, it is mostly innovative uh, solutions when it comes to biomass in, in, in certain areas or uh, uh, geothermal systems uh, and, and others, and our flagship system uh, in Toronto, Canada, which is a deep lake water cooling. Uh, deep lake water cooling started and uh, the project started in back in uh, 2002, uh, start the execution of the project. And it was initiated by uh, the, uh, uh, um, the demand on cooling in the city and was a proactive decision by the city of Toronto to fix a, an, an immediate problem they had with their Audible drinking water. And as you may all of you know, the location of Toronto is sitting right at the Lake Ontario. And the problem increased by having their intake potable water through the system fouling and need to be replaced. And they were working with engineers and consultants to come up with, with, uh, uh, with a solution for that. And the idea came about how we use the Lake Ontario as, as a cooling source, as well as solve the, the drinking water problem the city had that time. And anyway, we've been uh, initiated by the city of Toronto at that time. And they started the project with putting three pipes, three intakes to the lake. And the Lake Ontario and how this is beautifully work is the bottom of Lake Ontario, which is 80 meters below the water surface. The water temperature is 4 degrees C and as you see on this schematic, the lake has 3 pipes. It is a tow 
shape uh, uh, looking pipes going at the bottom of the lake, drawing the water at four degrees Celsius all year round. So it works perfectly for a cooling source and pulling the water from the lake at four degrees C, passing by point number one on the, on, on the schematic here, which is the island filtration plant. This is a drinking water filtration plant. So we filtered the water to becoming potable water for the drinking water system and pass it by point two on the diagram, which is our N-wave energy transfer station. So we exchange the energy with the drinking water, and then the water goes out from the transfer station to the water reservoir supplying the water to the consumers in the city, which is open the tap, the water is fine and still cold. On the other side of the, of the heat exchangers or the ETS is N-wave system, which is a completely closed loop system. We exchange the water with high efficiency heat exchangers and pushing this water to the customers. So as you see at point three, this is our cooling plant, which include, of course, we have summit chillers, electric driven chillers, and to use it during peak times, and when, um, when, uh, when we have uh, uh, emergencies or the lake water is not available. And we push the water to, to the customers. And I'll move to um, the next slide, please. So this is a real picture from our ETS. As you see, there is no chillers. There is nothing in there other than just 36 plate and frame heat exchangers with 70,000 US gallon per minute. And excuse me, I haven't converted the numbers to an SI unit. So we have the three intakes coming from the lake at a capacity 100,000 US gallon per minute. But we don't get this all the time. We all depend on how the people drinking water. So we encourage people in the city of Toronto to drink more water so we could have more capacity on, on N -wave, our N wave system. So we supply the temperature to the customers at 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately three and a half or four degrees to four degrees Celsius and getting the water back at about 13 to 14 degrees F was a, a massive Delta T. The system is, is high efficient system. Um, we, as you see, there is the, 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 the consumption of electricity. It is close to zero is 90% less than conventional cooling systems. And I'll, uh, I'll move to the next slide, please. So, and this is, this is the impact, and this is the picture on the top right. This is a real picture when they have put, put the, the nine miles of pipes into the Lake Ontario. It was a massive project, cost approximately 280 to 300,000, uh, so, sorry, $300 million. Uh, requires 75% less power than conventional chillers using pumping uh, to pump the That saves the city approximately 61 megawatt of electricity to install mechanical uh, chillers. And that reduces the emissions by approximately 400 tons of CO2 annually. We displace 1,391 kilograms of refrigerant by not using chillers. What an amazing system to address all, it hits all the points for renewable cooling, reducing emissions, and that system started in 2002. Until today, it's working and keep expanding. We just got approved to install a new pipe, a fourth intake into the lake to add additional 20,000 tons of cooling and to expand our system more into the city. We are supplying to more than 70 skyscrapers in downtown Toronto and we keep expanding. Move to the next place. As you see, this is our distribution map and we keep expanding our system. And what the deep lake water unlocked for us is thermal storage. As you know, during the nighttime when the peak dropped from, from commercial buildings and others customers, we added thermal storage in the east and west of the city to store the water during the night and, and dispatch it during the day to keep up with demand and reduce the need for mechanical cooling. To the next slide, please. This is one of our, our amazing project we have and a major development 
in downtown Toronto, it is more than 3 million square footage of multi-use multi uh, uh, project, commercial, residential, and retailer. And we added a thermal storage underneath the building. It shows at the bottom of the picture. It's about 7 million liter tanks for cooling during the summer. And we, uh, we charge it with low carbon heat during the winter using our heat pump. Um, and it supplies a whole amount of cooling and heating to the complex and expanding out of that. To the next slide, please. And, and with, with such system and support from, we have to get the support from local utilities and government, and we're getting all the support from uh, the local uh, government to from an incentive to customers who are using the systems and for new for new customers. I will, I will stop here and I'll, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give it back to you, uh, to you, Jan. Okay, very, very interesting. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Moye, and uh, for, for this uh, um, uh, um, presentation. It's very interesting because uh, it's, it's a really typical, it's an interesting business model in terms of uh, uh, water utility with energy. So it's a very much integrated, actually, the sector coupling, sector, sector uh, uh, integration, actually, at the at city level. And it's a very interesting. And I have a question for you. Maybe later you can think about it. Is it one is definitely okay? How much you charge and compared to you know uh, their use and users compared to conventional? And I'm sure that you have done this study. If you can give us a little bit of uh, uh, insights about that, will be very interesting in terms of cost for consumers using you know your alternative uh, uh, solutions, and uh, and also the, probably your uh, cooperation with the water supply companies and i'm sure that you want to give them for free the waters <laughs> you purify for them and but we can discuss about the business model. i think this is also a very interesting uh, technology system probably for uh, uh, asia especially the population density there is very high and the demand is high so that's very interesting we can talk about it later and last speaker but not absolutely not the least and we're going to invite uh ruth uh, and Mikani and uh, from uh, uh, CLASP, and uh, she is associate uh, uh, Eastern uh, Africa. Uh, would like to, uh, uh, she, she's going to bring uh, another perspective, another actually uh, continent, Africa, and to the, to the discussion, which is very important too, because it's uh, in future next three decades, the, the population grows from half from Asia, and half from Africa. So this is also another huge and the demand. And also this is a very much uh, uh, area region and uh, exposed to the to the to the heat and requiring and uh, cooling demand. So the floor is yours. And uh, Ruth, please uh, give us your uh, thought. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Young, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. So I'm going to be talking to you about the work we've been doing on renewable cooling applications and are particularly focusing on off-grid cold chain solutions. Um, next slide, please. So in, uh, in 2018, uh, we launched the first uh, global competition for off-grid cold chain cooling solutions meant to identify energy efficient, sustainable, as well as cost effective um, Cold storage that could meet um, uh, requirements for cold chains in off grid areas. And this was by con combining both the technology and business models assessment. Now, this graphic is just to highlight some of the, like, the core unit components around for cold chain. And uh, yeah, typically uh, it's for off grid use, so it'd be powered by solar. And uh, innovation around this technology can be realized through the um, by experimenting of use of different materials for the various components. Uh, for example, the uh, insulation. Next slide, please. Now this uh, is just so different types of uh, cold chains exist, and this is just to highlight uh, examples of cold chains you can find in the food agricultural value chain. And so what is important to note is that um, across different uh, product chains, you will find different uh, storage demands with respect to temperature, humidity, uh, and this can be even within the same 
food category type and therefore uh, understanding this kind of nuances do actually impact a lot in terms of like the design for the uh, coal technologies as well as in terms of business approach applications. Next slide, please. Now, um, yeah, uh, coal chain uh, technologies are still, uh, they are very expensive and uh, for the most part outside of the purchasing power for the target communities, which are really smallholder farmers in uh, off-grid areas. And so it is really important to uh, couple and come up with innovative business models that can increase uh, affordability and increase accessibility for these services to these farmers. And uh, examples of those that we have seen from our archives uh, for now the cooling cooling as a service model, which allows um, the farmer just to pay for the cooling service itself and not have to necessarily acquire the equipment for themselves. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, since uh, off-grid coal chain technologies is still young, so they still face uh, challenges and uh, what we have seen is that um, power system sizing is a common challenge for a lot of these units, as well as issues of uh, high variable levels of low demand, which can result as um, can result from varying weather conditions or use patterns that these uh, technologies are put to. And uh, so there is therefore, yeah, need to support to uh, overcome these uh, technical challenges and. This is just to highlight uh, performance data for the two of the units that we had in the competition. You can see uh, unit A managed to fairly maintain the, the temperature range while unit B was not performing as well. Next slide, please. So these are some of the um, finally solutions that, uh, that we had for the off-grid coaching challenge. And uh, just to add that, yeah, for a lot of like the players currently in the market, uh, especially in here in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are seeing that uh, a lot of players lack capacity to rapid scale up uh, uh, and are also hindered by underdeveloped in-country uh, commercial ecosystems. And so these are areas that would uh, definitely need support on. Next, next slide, please. And so some of the activities that we are doing under the Efficiency for Access for which CLASP is our co-secretariat co is our first uh, to address the data gaps that are there uh, on the cold chain market is that uh, we are running laboratory and field testing for, refriger for off-grid refrigerators and cold storage units and also undertaking um, Cold chain market assessment studies, uh, especially looking at Kenya, India, and uh, Nigeria. Uh, and secondly, to also ensure that uh, we are coupling uh, these technologies with uh, good business business models. So we'll be uh, launching another uh, round of the off grid cold chain challenge uh, so as to attract more early stage uh, businesses. We're also having a uh, efficiency for access R&D fund that we are availing for companies to drive innovations for these technologies. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arus. It's very interesting and um, uh, presentation, especially you know, touch on the uh, uh, cold chain and this is very important, especially in the problem after post uh, COVID. And uh, probably mm -hmm. this, uh, this kind of awareness going to be uh, more. So we can, we can. I will come back to you when, with with question in terms of how actually we can think about the, what kind of support and uh, a rollout you just mentioned. And let me uh, bring uh, back all the panelists and here and with a uh, uh, start with a, a discussion. We have just uh, five minutes left because I was uh, given uh, fifteen minutes extra. So um, I have only five minutes left for discussion. Very brief. Lars, I will start with you. And uh, 
the question I posed there. So uh, how actually you can make the proposition to the utility if you haven't done so, and what kind of a challenge you are facing when you're discussing with, with uh, utilities. And uh, if there is technical or non-technical issues, and uh, how actually the government or other stakeholders could help actually to address those challenges and getting uh, this uh, thermally uh, uh, driven uh, cooling devices into the market, which I, I think this is going to be very helpful for the countries that are already very uh, stressed about uh, uh, electricity demand. So, uh, Lars, can you just very briefly give you one minute and the two, uh, to the point? Thank you. Lars, you're, you're there? Apparently. Oh. Okay. Hugo, yes, now I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And, uh, and basically, some power companies in some countries, they see the point in uh, cutting the, the power peak by uh, relocating the power production or energy production to local, uh, to local sites. However, um, since we have a, a plug and play system, which is also an, an air conditioner, then it is um, probably more of uh, our experience is that it's it's more of interest for distributors and installers of conventional air conditioning systems to engage with us in um, in uh, adopting solar cooling on the market. Oh, okay, okay, Th uh, thank you. And uh, for that, let me uh, uh, um, another question to uh, to uh, Moy. And about uh, the, uh, because this is a very a good setting configuration and also we are expanding. I'm sure that this is the base model already proven. It's, it's working very well over there. So just can, can you just give us a little bit of insights about uh, and how can you help customers to, to cut the cost? And also how you work with uh, the water utility. You come to them or they come to you? Thank you. Um, absolutely. And thank you. This is a great question, Young. And, um, uh, we, we've been seeing customers coming to us recently more and more, given that the electricity market is going like dramatically up and it keeps the, the, the electricity cost, peak cost, it is increasing. And also a lot of asset managers in their uh, um, action plan to be net zero. Uh, so they, they are running to, towards our, to connect to our system. And to respond to the cost difference, it varies a lot, depends where is the customer located from our, um, our tunnels and our infrastructure, because the cost of infrastructure also keep increasing, but we see approximately between 25 to 30% drop in costs or on assets uh, on site. But there is more to district energy than the cost drop on, on, on asset or infrastructure. Uh, for example, one of our major hotel and our system uh, removed their cooling towers of the roof and added a rooftop uh, swimming pool. Uh, how, 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 how nice is that? So this is one of the benefits of district energy, reduce significantly the amount of mechanical equipment need to be installed on site, and this space could be used for other uh, uh, activities. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Did you get the free pass to the swimming pool? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but it's a very good, interesting model. And uh, especially you touch upon a very important part is net zero. Absolutely. For the companies, carbon, because this is a climate that comes and uh, there will be, it's already coming, actually, price on carbon. So that is uh, something actually they can hold sort of insurance for future. That's what they have the cost cut. It's not only the operation cost as we compare. That's, I'm really appreciate that you. You, you mentioned that dimension, which is very important. And uh, to um, Ruth, and for, for your uh, question, I just see you mentioned, you know, there's a, uh, is a very much needed and uh, uh, um, technology and, and the practice. So what kind of exactly does the sort of support you are, you are looking for to roll out uh, uh, um, the applications you have in, in Africa? Can you just very brief? Thank you. Ruth? Yes, yes. Um... So I think um, uh, looking at the government uh, level, I think it will be very uh, useful if we, if we could have like um, governments intentionally uh, putting in place uh, policy instruments that uh, will 
encourage and facilitate more uptake of this kind of uh, nascent technologies that are really useful for the uh, for the for the off grid uh, smallhold farmers. So this would be one uh, one way that um, it would be useful. And uh, and I, I and I would say like an example as well of this would be. Uh, and it had been alluded earlier, and as well when it comes to like also creating awareness among consumer consumers, it will grow. A, it will yeah, it will grow. A, a, a take, it will take a great deal in terms of like uh, promoting consumer demand as well for this uh, product. Okay, Th thank you, thank you very much. And the way we heard you is very important because uh, both U uh, UNEP and the URINA is an intergovernmental organization, so. And we will definitely note it down and, uh, you know, put it, this is something that's probably and uh, the government uh, should be communicated more effectively with, with the national government in, in Africa and to promote this uh, technology. And uh, so uh, with that, I would like to very quickly uh, wrap up the entire, uh, this task that was given as well and the entire uh, session for the uh, renewable energy cooling. I, I think this is very interesting and the topic and this is uh, so one of the purposes as we said we are going to raise uh, awareness so i hope all the panelists and uh, participants you are with us uh, thank you very much for uh, uh with us uh, for for over due 20 minutes almost and uh, we we need your lights over and uh, messenger and uh, ambassador to get this message out all of the participants you are with us uh, today's session and uh, for the for the uh, key message basically you can see the demand side from both Africa and, and Asia, and the demand is huge. It's going to increase, it's going to be a big challenge, but this challenge cannot be solved overnight. So I have to, something we start from now. And uh, technology-wise, there's a uh, uh, starting from small and to the large distribute generations and uh, already very proven technologies and the technology there is, is available. So just to have to get the, the government and the users aware of that and uh, matching the both. And the context is that they have to understand, you know, this is a increasingly challenging dynamics and uh, for the energy and uh, uh, systems. And so we have to address and uh, uh, from the uh, technology providers, more innovative technology adding to this uh, uh, dynamic, uh, to this uh, uh, landscape. And for the for the user side, they have to look out of sort of box, not only the uh, uh, electricity, but also actually the other and the sources for uh, cooling to meet their cooling demand, such you know uh, thermally driven and also the free cooling from the deep water, and uh, so uh, and also for Africa, that's a cold chain is very also important. So with that, I would uh, uh, close uh, this uh, session. And with uh, a big thank to all uh, the speakers and the panelists, and including the previous sessions as well. This is uh, all of them, is, and also Lily with the, everyone uh, behind the uh, the, the webinar, supporting you know, uh, providing supporting uh, uh, assistance to make this uh, webinar available. And I really appreciate everyone's uh, uh, input and the support. And uh, okay, let's uh, keep uh, over um, the the future cooling markets and uh, uh, growing and because of this to meet this demand with uh, um, uh, the market is, is growing let's try to uh, fix this problem uh, altogether thank you very much for everyone so with that i will close this session apologize and for the overrun <laughs>